Welcome to the Midnight Special Bookstore Poetry Series. My name is Leo Guerra and I'm the director of the series. This evening uh, we have uh, two featured readers and then we're going to go into an open reading. The two featured uh, readers are Maricela Norte. And I take it some of you have heard me before. <laughs> Maricela's going to be signing the CDs and the cassettes <laughs> uh, after the break. Uh, but who doesn't have a book right now, but is going to have one in October. Is Michelle Settles, who's been reading around town with a group called Iquemas. Iquemas! Iquemas! And uh, she's been reading on her own also. Yeah. And it's my pleasure to introduce <coughs> Michelle Settles. to my uncle. My favorite uncle Vicente is a professional, one of few in our family, for my uncle owns a catering truck, a coach as in super rico taco, mariachi blaring expired license plate luncheria, but a nice one. He always dreamt of one day owning his own business, becoming a self-employed man, his own boss, Soccer on Sundays, sleeping off hangovers on Monday. He loved those short work weeks. So finally, after scraping up what little money he had, he got the coach. It helped Johnny, his fourth kid, get through college, kept Aunt Dolly up all night, chopping and chopping with dull knives, cilantro, onions, tomato. No money left to buy sharp ones. I knew every time Dad packed us up to travel the distance from Oxnard to Chino, we would eat good. <laughs> we would eat free. Our uncle was a restaurateur. His place had everything any fine establishment had. Sesos, lenguas, tripas, and my favorite chicharrones. My mother always warned, that's solid lard. Pure grease. That poor dead pig's gonna have its revenge on you yet. Make you fat. Make you fart. Scatter your skin with white tipped pimples. No man's gonna want you. Her graphic hot words tried to gross me out. Didn't even work. I couldn't get enough of that crackly pork skin. I crammed them into tortillas that were always too small. So I ate them right out of the pot, throwing the small crispy bits into the air, like popcorn letting them land in my wide, anxious mouth. I used to eye my cousin Amy's pet piglet. With a week I'd say, see you in a couple of years. Amy crying into the house. One day on an ordinary visit while I sat in the coach's shade, I could see my father talking chickens with Uncle Vincent, my mother inside with Aunt Dolly, and I was shoving my dear chicharrones into my mouth. Something happened. They stayed right there in my throat. I swallowed hard to help them down, coughed firmly to help them up, but they wouldn't budge. I could feel coarse pig hairs tickle my face. But I wasn't laughing. This was not funny. I couldn't breathe. I was going to die. My mother was right. The dead pig's revenge. My father was suddenly miles away. Thoughts raced through my mind. Who'll take care of Miss Rosie, my pet goat? I still haven't got student of the month. <laughs> but more agonizing than any of these things, any of these things, I thought of the headline, the headline in my obituary. <laughs> Chicharron. 
communist chokes Chicana child to death. <laughs> In Chino. <laughs> oh my God, I can't die with a headline like that. The humiliation. I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. I wanted to live so bad, but my legs lost balance. I was getting no more air. Suddenly a thud. It was dark. I woke up to find Cousin Amy above me. You were turning blue, so I punched you on the back like they do on TV. <laughs> now everybody came running. That night, Amy got her favorite dinner. My mom and dad shook their heads with disgust, hearing her repeat the story over and over again. But I didn't care. I was alive. I was free to walk, to breathe, to think and to eat. I stepped outside to the backyard and walked over to the caged pen, watching over Amy's sleeping pet piglet. It was so full of life, a beautiful breathing thing. I spent all night with it, watching and thinking and waiting and salivating. <laughs> to write Angela off for good. That's one of the things I really try to do best in my life, write people off. From one little screw up to the major straw that breaks this camel's back, I try to keep my friends as temporary as my patients. I guess friend really isn't the proper word here. Perhaps people that annoy me the least. <laughs> or people that keep me from watching too much TV. Better yet, people I really don't want to write off because someday in the future I may need something from them. <laughs> I put up with all kinds of crap people dish out just because I worry what I may lose out if I lose them. It's a real thought process when it comes to me deciding who will remain in my life and who will be history. But I've just about had it with Angela. She's always late. I mean, always. Here it was already a quarter after three, and she still wasn't at my house. She just got back from Louisiana yesterday and made such a big deal about wanting to see me. What a liar. I've known her all my life, and never once has she been on time. I'm so sick of it. But I know today is the last day I will ever have to put up with her. As I waited for her car to drive up my street, I thought of all the people I have to put up with. The list seems endless. Take my friend Nene. She pisses me off all the time, real bad. Doesn't even matter to say exactly what she does, but it involves my boyfriend Jean's hair and the fact that she's a hairstylist. <laughs> Hairstylists are the worst, always reaching out, touching your hair, not even asking first. With a wrinkled nose, they're always asking who cut it last, <laughs> ask if you use salon-only products, tell you how they and only they alone can improve its current condition. Anyway, Nene touches Jean's hair way too many times, and I've just about had it. Anytime I say something about it in a joking way, she always says, what? Don't be so possessive. I'm a hair artist. This is my craft. I'm working my craft. And she goes on stroking his hair, talks about rubbing mango chutney through it to stimulate his scalp. Man, that really burns me up. But I know if I ever get serious with her and pull her aside to tell her, look, I'm the only woman in my boyfriend's life who will ever stimulate him, so why don't you make like scissors and get the hell out of my life? She'll get all upset and never speak to me again. Then I'll lose all contact with her and her older brother, Mike. As his name implies, he is a mechanic. Works out of an independent Swedish dealership in Santa Monica. Probably the only Mexican I know who works on Bobos on the west side and wears clogs to work. <laughs> I drive a Honda, but still, he knows how to do everything to a car. I mean everything. And he promised when my car reaches 100,000 miles, he'll give it a good workover, real good. 
I remember his promise every time Nene reaches for Jean's hair. <laughs> if I don't keep my mouth shut, I'll end up dishing out big bucks to some unknown grease monkey in the yellow pages. And monkeys, I wonder what I should do about that other annoying person I hang out with. Jay Walker, as in Johnny Walker. He's one of those self-promoting rocker or musician types who names himself after every alcoholic weakness he happens to have at the time. Two, month ago, two months ago, he was Jay Daniels. <laughs> and during May, he called himself Jay Cuervo, <laughs> thinking a stupid band would get more Cinco de Mayo gigs or something. What an idiot. All he does is talk about himself and his new band of the week. The next big thing, he tells me, we're talking first out of the gate into the lead turbo rock and roll action. Like, I really care. <laughs> he never asked about me, how I'm doing, what's going on with my life, school, nothing. He's always swinging by my work just to see if I'll give him free fries or something. And the whole time, he's talking, he's playing with this little silver-plated iron cross trinket that hangs from a chain his ex-girlfriend brought for him. The ex-girlfriend, he just had to let go because, hey, he said, she was just getting too serious. And hey, I'm a horny guy, a musician, a stallion who can't be lassoed. <laughs> Give me a break. Something about grown men who identify themselves with hoofed animals and play with their jewelry while they talk really scares me. But I put up with it, and I'll continue to put up with it because he has a job at a Xerox place over in the valley. <laughs> color Xerox two-sided prints for free. I mean anything I want. Full access, no questions asked, rain, two unlimited flyers, spiral binding, laser printouts, special typeset. I name it, I get it. I have to remind myself every time I have to listen to him talk, playing with his charm necklace, listening to him brag of his band's next photo shoot. The same photographer he lies to me, who did Guns N' Roses' last CD. I smile, nod with pseudo-interest, and think of the next slam book I'm going to have him print up for me. <laughs> anyway, back to Angela. It was already 4 p.m. Our date was for 2 p.m. I couldn't wait to finalize our friendship this afternoon. Her treatment showed absolutely no respect, but there's so much involved. Besides being a childhood playmate, blood sister, things like that, she really, she really, there was only one good reason why I couldn't write her off. Angela's mom owns a recreational vehicle, <laughs> which means she travels a lot. She loves to show off her worldliness by plastering the back of their RV with stickers from every state she's visited. Everything from a great big Georgia peach to cow to a hooting Texas cowboy rub on. She's been everywhere. Almost 41 emblems to brag about. And from every one of those 41 states she's went to, she's brought me back a snow dome. I love snow domes. You know those round plastic globes with the little landmark replica inside and when you shake it, those mini chips float around? I'm nine globes away from having a complete United Domes of America set. <laughs> Only nine away. And if I blow her off today, I'll never have a true set. And to me, that's one of the most important things in my life right now, from having a collection of stuff I'm proud of. You know, I finally realized why people have other people in their lives. Not for love or companionship, nurturing, or any of that human need crap they feed you in psychology class. The real reason we have people in our lives is because we want stuff. Free stuff. And we'll put up with all kinds of shit together. We'll lie to 
get what we want from my Chilean girlfriend, Marta, who tells the paid parking lot attendant she's Peruvian just like him so she could park for free. <laughs> to my Aunt Dolly, who makes Cousin Amy slouch to an under 12 years age of size so she can get a price break on a Happy Steak meal. Everyone likes a deal. Everyone. And then to brag about it later to some sucker who paid full price, that's the best. <laughs> we all do it. We all have the same kiss-ass mentality to, to get stuff, stuff, and more stuff. What a real lousy way to live. This self-realization overwhelmed me, but at least I made myself aware of it and I can do something about it, change my own pattern. No more will I put up with people's crap. I will say exactly how I feel, get them out of my life before it's too late. Just then I saw Angela turn the corner onto my street. I didn't care how long I'd known her. That at age 13 we pricked our fingers, that someday she'll be my maid of honor, or that she and only she alone can complete my snow dome collection. She's really a lousy friend. I missed my prom because my date and her, my date and I double dated with her and her creep of a boyfriend, only because she had the car. I've missed concerts, airplane flights, the first 15 minutes of every film I've seen with her. <laughs> missed the eulogy to my own mother's funeral because of her. I hate her. I truly do. Her friendship with me was no longer valid, and she was going to find out today. She pulled up into my driveway, beeping her car horn. I smiled to myself. This will be the last time your car honks in my driveway, I thought. She was all apologetic, all apologizing. Sorry I'm so late. Please don't be mad. Don't be mad. Hey, look, look what I brought for you. She was holding a bag, and inside I looked. The most beautiful sight I've ever seen. A big green alligator with a clear plastic belly. Inside, baby alligators playing on a teeter-totter that said New Orleans bright orange letters. Snowflakes floating all around. I really wanted this snow go bad. I mean, my hands started sweating with anticipation. I wanted to take it from her, but I knew I'd never respect myself if I did. And she certainly wasn't going to give it to me after I told her what a crummy friend she's been. I really felt confused. But I had to tell her, but I really wanted that snow dome. <laughs> Just then she said, guess what? I'm going to Europe with my mom next summer. Can you believe it? My graduation gift instead of a new car. Can you imagine what kind of snow domes they have there? <laughs> you have a collection from around the world. <laughs> I took the bag from her hands and smiled, that fake smile I'm so good at. She put her arms around me to give me a hug. I'm really going to miss you, three months away from my best friend. I stood there letting her hug me. I felt so lousy, but a lot less confused. <laughs> I hugged her back thinking about patience being a virtue, taking the good with the bad. <laughs> you gotta have friendship. <laughs> I took the plastic alligator from her hands, and I really thought about how I'm going to need a bigger display case for my growing collection. <laughs> answers the question of what is bad. <laughs> Donna Rodriguez is bad. More than bad, she has the power, the kind of power that gets respect, the kind of respect I envy. Every Monday morning, like a movie star, encased by tinted windows, her black Trans Am pulls up into the employee lot, taking up two spaces. Nobody dare complain. Now that's bad. <laughs> All the employees, men, women alike, part the way, heads humbly bow, so Donna can make her way to the company time clock. Suit of armor she wears well, 50 pounds extra flesh, padding a 48 double D brassiere, sweat rings saturating size 29 blouse. 
She slowly strolls by. Petite crucifix sways on a chain, sharing space with a gold-plated self-proclamation. 100% bitch. <laughs> Diamond chip dotting the eye. Now that is bad. <laughs> At lunch break, all the Anglo women shudder in fear as Donna whips out Weight Watchers Mexi cuisine. <laughs> She's on a diet again. It's gonna be a long week. <laughs> they pretend to be her friend. Get on her good side early. Ask about Hector, her 29-year-old baby behind bars, her red press-on nails, and does she have a good recipe for salsa? <laughs> Donna knows their game, stays silent, takes long, slow drags off Marlboro lights. Her eyes squint, judging their sloppy eyeliner, creaseless corduroys, <laughs> tofu tacos. <laughs> After letting out a post-battle yawn, she heads back to her cubicles, plural. While all of us are crammed into pet size square, Donna gets two, all to herself. I'm a big woman, I need bigger space. And she got it just like that. The boss is terrified of her. It's rumored he recently saw Zoot Suit on Showtime. <laughs> and with her white eye shadow, penciled in brows, baby tattoo nestled between thumb and finger, he suspects she could have been, might very well still be, a chuka. As in chuka, a non-existent breed in his West Side life, but here, now, living large in the workplace, his workplace, and he doesn't want any trouble. Mr. Equal Opportunity Employer and scared. <laughs> scared of Donna who gets weekends off, extended lunches, advanced loans, leaves work early on Fridays to make it to the bank, has two parking spaces. <laughs> now that is bad. <laughs> It's a short story, and I think we could all identify with it. Discrimination breeds in the Ralph supermarket on Venice and Overland. Not in employee opportunities, race, age, or sex, nothing like that, but rather in the temperature control depths of the frozen food section. <laughs> My friend Martine pointed this out to me one day. He and I were both on aisle nine going for mixed frozen vegetables. He was going to make Spanish rice later that night. The vegetables make it colorful, you know, festive-like. <laughs> Seconds after he opened the glass door, Martin said, look, look at this. He pulled out two frosted bags from the bottom compartment, Malibu-style vegetables, and check this out, Latino-style vegetables. <laughs> As if we all eat alike. I've never seen this. Man, even in the lousy freezer, they divide and they discriminate. Marthy and I asked them, they're vegetables. How can they be discriminating? Give me a break. <laughs> he went on, man, you don't even see it. You're so, so unaware. Look at this picture. Latino-style vegetables, they have the vegetables cut up all small. Like, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> like, little food for little people? Little minds, little significance or something? And this Malibu kind, the broccoli, the carrots, they're cut up all large, all big and grand like a great worth or something. The cauliflower, which is white, is the biggest vegetable in the picture. All the best. Oh, Martine, I told him, you're seeing something that just isn't there. You're crazy to get worked up on your vegetables. Now just grab a bag and let's go. I'm not crazy, he protested. This is how it starts. And look, look at this. The Latino style vegetables are all spilling out of this wicker basket, all overflowing, messy like insinuating that we are overflowing, overcrowding what they think is their man. And what's with this wicker basket? You know, we don't use baskets to cart our food around. 
The Malibu style vegetables are all neat and in order, <coughs> properly arranged in a nice white porcelain crock. No problem causing vegetables here. They're orderly, dignified. <laughs> dignified vegetables, Martine? Is there such a thing? <laughs> he was no longer paying attention. I lost him to his newfound cause. <laughs> and look at this, the packaging. Malibu style is labeled from Ralph's private selection. <laughs> private as in not everyone is welcome. <laughs> no entry to you, especially you immigrant, go back. <laughs> By this time a small crowd had formed. <laughs> everyone was listening to Martin. <laughs> he didn't care, he continued. Malibu style are twice as expensive as Latino style vegetables. Why? Are they better vegetables? Did white people from Malibu pick them themselves? <laughs> Did they take off from some corporate meeting early or leave the tennis court? Mid game to fly up north to put on their designer jeans and get on their hands to pick their own kind of vegetable? Did they? <laughs> Martin waved the thought-out bags over his head and flung them to the ground. The crowd cheered as an array of green, orange, and white exploded on the supermarket floor. He started to stomp on them, on the soggy, newly integrated vegetables, <laughs> mashing them into the store and linoleum. And then this extraordinary thing happened. One by one, people started to pull the frozen produce bags out of the freezer compartments. I saw a Korean woman and her two kids stomp on Oriental-style vegetables. <laughs> a young guy in cowboy boots kicked country-style vegetables. <laughs> And this handsome, dark-haired man ripped apart a bag of Italian-style vegetables. More and more, people began to pull the bags out of the compartment and destroy, and destroy the corporate invention of stereotypes in a bag. Martin stood back by the sterilely frozen desserts to enjoy the beauty of the revolt he created. But his clenched fist victory was soon interrupted. An angry and overweight manager pushed his way through the crowd and ordered a breakup. You, he said as he pushed his finger into Martin's chest, are trying to incite a riot in my store. You see this here? He pointed to his name badge which stated, Bob Howard Smith, store director. I'm in charge here. I want you to take your friend, take everything, and get out of here now. Martine picked up our plastic hand basket and threw our other groceries onto the floor. The crowd cheered even louder. <laughs> he looked straight into the store manager's eyes and said, Man, take your finger out of my face. I'd rather shop at pavilions than come back to your sorry store. He then grabbed my arm and pushed our way through the cheering crowd, leaving behind a revolution of dissatisfied customers and the vegetables we no longer needed. <laughs> Thank you very much. There is a donation box up there if you get a chance. It's uh, 